So hi, um, I've been wanting to talk about display and title lettering um, and just give you guys some exciting examples of it and show how much it can enrich um, basically our story, our panels, um, and also show you some ways in which the characters can even interact with it. And to that end, we'll start with Will Eisner. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is a great example from the spirit. Almost always the spirit's title was um, diegetic, meaning that it was part of the story, or at least it looked like it was part of the world. And in this instance, obviously, you can see S-P-I-R-I-T going into the distance, and the bad guys plaster all over the, <laughs> the letters. It's terrific. And one guy even crucified at the end. And then up on top is this sort of like, you know, beginning of the story sort of tacked onto the top of the S. Fox at Bay, the title of the story, is sort of written in the dirt there and on this sort of um, blanket or something is the signature Will Eisner and there's just so many great things about uh, this um, from the composition and the, and the graphic design but also just the, the interesting fun ways in which the letters become part of the story in our heads. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tons of examples of, of Eisner doing that in the spirit. Um, some for fun, you know, knocking the character knocking a bad guy into the letters, or it's a poster here on the left, or the spirits leaning up against these tall buildings, which are part of the skyscraper. It's it's metaphorical. It's also you know he's looming over the city. He's protecting the city. They almost look like beacons in a way in this bottom right one. So from that, um, <clears throat> we can actually look at a uh, uh, original. Art, we can see some of the paste-up lines and some of the things going on here in, in this Eisner one. But it's also got a lot of great lettering on it. Let me notice this guy, this bad guy behind this rocky spirit written in, in blocky rock cement. Um, Octopus, the, the bad, the villain in this story, written in this drippy lettering here on the left. Uh, um, and notice the gun sort of aiming in on the left. That's the beginning. That's page one. The last page of the story, it's really interesting. You see a mirror image. Nobody really notices this. But the pen Eisner is using is lettering, of course not, here. Um, in answer to the question, is that the end of the octopus? Is that at, le at last the end of the octopus? And the pen is mimicking and exactly mirroring the, the hand that was holding the gun in panel one. With that lettering, he's playing around with the lettering again. That is that is dripping and octopus, and of course not is written by the hand that has created the comic. So, excuse me, Eisner, you know, one of the first people to let you remember that you're reading a comic and that the hand of the author is guiding you through this, and and, and never, you know, never worried that you were going to lose your lose track of the uh, story or lose the excitement of the story if he broke that. If you broke that um, fourth wall. <clears throat> Here's another simple example. What's interesting about this is the way this whole leads you, this whole thing leads you in a spiral. This is a classic example from Robert Crumb, Nausea, the Jean Paul Sartre um, uh, book, which he uh, did a sort of shrunk down version of. Um, the amazing thing, and we'll zoom in is this title. We'll zoom in one more time and you'll just see how much care went into making that nauseating, disgusting, ripping, vomity lettering. I'll zoom back one more time, but you know, it's a um, lettering is a big part of your page. It's a big part of your of, of the visual landscape of the page. It's drawing. And this is a great example of somebody who probably took a day just to letter that. There's that. From there, there's a great example from uh, from Ken Dahl's Monsters. This is when he's going into telling you a little more about the herpes virus and the character himself, naked, is dived into the waters where you're about to learn about it. And there's just great lettering going on all over here. Uh, classic display title lettering from Parr and the other EC comics. Um, you know, the vault is metal with these rivets on it in horror. Still not sure exactly where this, this origin, the origin of these like drippy sort of 
things hanging on the letters comes from to make us feel kind of scared or spooked, but it's definitely all over the place in EC Comics. Dearly beloved, it's all sort of legally. Um, the Witch's Cauldron. This is more fiery, lava-y, you know, coming up out of the bottom. I'm, I include some of these too because you can see lots of paste-up lines and, and glue that has fallen off, and you can see how, how <clears throat> excuse me, in the 50s some of this would have been done. This would have been printed on a, a sort of smooth paper over and over and over again. They would have had, they would have tons of copies of this. They waxed it on. This was probably waxed on too, and it's fallen off over the decades. Where there's a, where there's it was probably where there's a will or where there's a, where there's a kill. I, I don't really remember. Uh, dialing it back a little and going a little more mellow. Crazy Cat is known for really fun lettering. Uh, George Harriman would sort of throw it wherever it fits, and maybe even start with the lettering. I'm not even sure, but here it is in the upper right. Here it is in thin row here on the on the left. Crazy, this little this little signifier here and cat there. He'd invent all sorts of symbols and just motifs really. Um, there it is again, crazy and cat in this sort of like ball shaped, um, ball shaped shape. It's a, it's a lovely one just from color and, and, and composition alone. The crazy in the upper left. Again, one of those little symbols or motifs, cat in the upper right. And it sort of like, sort of bookends and surrounds the top part of the story. Simple one <clears throat> um, from uh, by from Skippy, and I think I originally thought it was sort of like falling down, but I actually think that might be a fence behind him, and so it's written on the, the the boards of the fence. But either way, it's just it's just has a liveliness to it that um, the rest of the drawing does too. I think Pierce Crosby is the is the art artist here, and he was one of Schultz's favorites. Here's a great example of of um, brush lettering and organic lettering, but also lettering that is very similar to the style of the drawing. And so this is from Craig Thompson's Blankets, and look how soft this semi-cursive writing is and how brushy it is, and it's exactly the same sort of softness that he creates the trees with and the, and the characters, and this soft, brushy white here. Um, and just everything, and everything conveying this soft, wintry light. Um, should be noted down here, this is almost certainly a typed out um, version of this that he typed out and then uh, probably traced by hand. I'm, I'm guessing this was entirely created by hand. Blanket. The exact opposite of that is the Hernandez first page. Flies on the ceiling is a story of um, Isabel Ortiz sort of going through this exorcism, this genuine exorcism to get rid of this. Complicated than that, but flies on the ceiling is written here with just utter grossness and with the probably sloppiest brush he could find and digs in and, and throw some white down. And I'm going to see if I can zoom in here and get a little bit closer on it. You can just see how rough and ugly it is, and it's meant to be, excuse me, coarse and um, and off-putting and scary. The opposite of that is uh, something like this that's so designy. You know, these these letters, the mamie up here, are, evoke and sort of echo the shapes around the package. So many of these strong, brushy shapes all around here. Even even Russell Patterson, I think that's his name, <coughs> is so echoes the elegance of some of these rounder shapes here, and these shapes, and just everything about the lettering, and especially the title and the signature here, are all about the design and the flair. Of, of the single panel. Um, here's one by Kim Deitch. It's funny, Milton in college is written out in toy blocks down here. Um, again, diegetic, part of the story or part of the image anyway. It's kind of fun. Um, Joe Sacco's, um, this is prob, I think from the Palestine era, although now he's in Egypt. Um, you can see him just really going for it to, to show you how chaotic Cairo is. And uh, uh, the dialogue, of course, and the captions are 
all over the place in the Cairo. It's covered up by dialogue and horns and characters leaning on it and stuff like that. It's similar here, Blind Dates. He always loved lettering and he loved drawing and he loved the same, you know, he loved nausea. <coughs> Excuse me. He loved Robert Crumb. Um, you know, so it's the same kind of, kind of uh, drive to create a really dense visual experience for the reader that, say, Crumb created in Nausea or um, Ken Dahl created in, in Monsters. This is just some examples seen on the internet of people creating, sort of creating comics with lettering only or titles only. This is all computer, but it's fine. It's fun. Arg, crack, crack, bam. Um, I'm just showing you how much can be thought about when it comes to sound effect lettering, title lettering, um, what's called display lettering, how much that a lettering affects how we experience it, how we hear it, how we, the, you know, the rhythm of it. This is Kaboom. Um, Von Baudet, or Bodhi, uh, popularized this bubble lettering you see here in Dadul. Um, soon everybody anywhere near a subway car was uh, copying his lettering style with their spray cans. Um, Calvin and Hobbes did great fun things with lettering. Um, the alien Calvin here is speaking in this uh, this squarish lettering in the squarish boxes. Um, but since we're talking about titles, it should be noted that Calvin and Hobbes, like this, almost never changed. That it, uh, it had a real consistency to it that was really elegant, even though in his later years, Watterson changed everything else about the page. Um, Patrick McDonald, who does Mutz, has a habit of, in the first panel of his um, comic, uh, writing Mutz out and copying something he's seen before. So here you see Mutz comics copying, I think this, I recorded this from a book of his or something, this uh, ale that he'd found somewhere. This is a, a Trout Mask replica by Captain Beefheart cover. Uh, I should know <laughs> what this is, Cruising with Ozzy and the Mutz, but I don't. But it's definitely another album cover he's sort of stealing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he's just playing around. And I think there's another example. Yeah, classic lettering example of... Um, Elvis Presley's first album, and then The Clash destroying it, but mimicking it exactly anyway. You know, that guitar in Elvis's hand is being utterly destroyed in that last panel, or in that, in that, in that echo 20 years later, you know, 25. Um, but the lettering is the same. I'm trying to tell you this is not your, your mother's rock and roll. Lettering means something, you know. Lettering echoes other uses of the lettering. When you use a font, when you use any kind of typeface, you're saying, I know something about what this means in history. I know that you've seen this font before. You know it's the American Airlines font, and that's why I'm using it. Or, or you know it's the EC Comics Vault of Horror font, and that's why I'm using it. Sometimes it's really important to, to know where you're coming from with it. Uh, so similar to that, um, Rusty Brown, this is uh, Chris Ware's Rusty Brown comic. And as I understand it, the top half and the bottom half will ultimately be collected in a sort of horizontal shaped book. And I think this blank area is just a play area for, um, for, for Chris Ware because this is a uh, Chicago Reader page. It'll be printed in the newspaper like this, but ultimately it'll be collected um, horizontally. So this section is just this playfulness, this, playful, this play area for him. And he plays around with he invents fonts from the 70s, he uses fonts from the 70s, um, and he just sort of uh, has some fun with it, because this all takes place in the, in the 70s, as I understand it. You can see Rusty Brown changing over and over again. Chris Ware is never satisfied. It's, it's quite amazing. I was a real typographer, I would know a lot more about these particular typefaces. So that's it, we're back to the spirit. And I like to ask people to just do one panel, one title maybe, or somewhere in a panel that's part of the comic to use one word or use your title or 
insert a word in there and do it. And I encourage people to do it diegetically. Insert one diegetic word into your story somewhere. The spirit that we've just seen is a great example. If it's not, if, you know, if bad guys aren't hanging off the letters, that's fine. You know, <laughs> if, if, uh, if it's not dripping onto the page in the comic, that's fine. But, um, but I hope all of this is inspiration to um, really utilize the display lettering, the title lettering, in interesting, innovative ways that especially, um, especially reflect your story and enhance your story. So have fun with that exercise.